So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Guillermo Morella from Magnil Europe, and I'm here today with Daniel Wallente and Martin from Tyrants, a multidisciplinary consulting firm. Daniel is a structural engineer and computational design lead, involved in early stage designs, research projects, as well as leading the company's digital transformation strategy. Wallente is also a structural engineer with a strong focus on early design stages and the seamless integration of structural engineering into the architectural vision. And Martin is a bridge engineer who works on both the early stage design and production stages. They will show their philosophy of how to use Rhino, Grasshopper, and other linked applications to collaborate and automate designs. And also with some examples, they will show the diverse ways they as engineers collaborate with architects. Remember that you can ask questions in the chat and we will check them in the last 15 minutes after the presentation and also that the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel where you can find more webinars and tutorials. Thank you again for joining us and thank you uh, for accepting the invitation. And please start with the presentation when you're ready. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much for the introduction and having us present our work on uh, our view on design-driven engineering. Uh, my name is Tony Lowry, and I work as a structural engineering computation design lead at Tyrians. Um, me and my colleagues, Gant and Martin, is going to focus this presentation on how Rhino and Grasshopper enables us as designers to work iteratively with structural design, and also how we inform the architectural design process in early stages. We work at the Swedish consultancy firm uh, that's called Tyrians, which consists of offices in Sweden with the main office in Stockholm. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary firm with services in the whole range of architectural and engineering. Uh, within Tyrians Group, we also have AKT2 and Nilsson Moran in the UK, and Kjellprojektas in Lithuania and Tari in Estonia. Uh, me and Giente uh, are part of our structural engineering department in Stockholm, and Martin works for the bridge department in uh, North Shopping. And we're going to center this presentation around the work we do in our structural design network, as we call it, the SDN. So the structural design network. Uh, to empower our role as structural designers, we have established uh, an internal network within Tyrians that we call the Structural Design Network. And, um, we focus on the role of the engineer as a designer, and we develop design methodology uh, that not only focuses around the traditional engineering tasks. Um, from our perspective, structural design can be many things. Um, and the goal of the network is to develop our engineers to be sort of confident leaders in early design phases. Um, and in order to have a more holistic view on design, we focus not only what works structurally, but on design parameters such as sustainability, material, concept design, and design communication. We are currently 15 design ambassadors, as we call it, in the network, and we are six design mentors that support uh, the ambassadors. And we believe that this work gives us the confidence to work with the uncertainties that is part of these early design phases. Uh, and we think that in early design, it's better to be vaguely right than exactly wrong. Uh, and we're going to talk about how we use Ryan and Grasshopper to sort of empower us in this. We know from experience that we as structural designers need to strengthen our role in early design phases where, because that's where we have the most impact. Uh, we like to work from conceptual design through schematic design and, of course, all the way to construction, but it's in the early design phases where we have most design influence and the cost impact is the lowest on the project. 
This is possible thanks to Tehens research and innovation culture. Um, we are owned by a private foundation that invests a lot in innovation and research. And we take innovation very seriously and are aiming to be uh, the industry leader in discovering, developing, and scaling innovations. Here is showcased some of Tehens innovations that has been taken from IDEA via our seed program all the way to product development and market release in the past few years. The foundation also supports research, which is important in our network to develop early stage design methodology. And in this particular program or in this particular project, we work together with FOIAB architects EVL and Warm in the Winter to develop a climate tool in Grasshopper. Uh, we use a Swedish environmental database that is called BM database to estimate carbon emission, cost, and energy performance from simple volumetric studies in vinyl. And uh, a role as computational designers and engineers in this pro project is to develop both the methodology and the grasshopper components that en enables us uh, en enables the architect to get sort of instant feedback on structural systems from simple uh, Rhino geometries. So the idea is that the user can sketch volu volumes in Rhino and provide some simple inputs on structural material, spans or grid layout, uh, location, et cetera. And in order, to, yeah, in order to generate a structural system that can be used for quantification. Uh, this type of feedback on structure in early design is, is often based on generic template data, uh, but we, we are trying to find a methodology that rapidly gets the designer feedback from actual member sizing and structural design. Um, the methodology is not built around a structural analysis model or a finite element model. Uh, and since it since it's uh, it's too early in the design phase for that, um, but rather on a regression model in this case. Uh, the loads are estimated from, from an automated Voronoi algorithm and can be used for any arbitrary boundary geometries. Um, and as I said, this can be used for, for quantifications uh, to calculate carbon emission and cost. And I also want to credit um, the collaboration we had with, um, with FOIAB and Women Winter, where Simon Kalyanen at FOIAB has done a lot of development on, on the on the FOIAB side of this project. As you may have understood, uh, in early design, Rhino and Grasshopper is our core. Uh, and we connect multiple structural engineering software to Grasshopper. We also work a lot in Revit and Tecla and the development of Rhino inside as well as Grasshopper's develop Grasshopper development for Tecla has been great for us when we transfer our structural models to, to the BIM model. Um, to further deal with data and to control our parametric models, we develop in Python, both inside Grasshopper, which is, uh, as you may know, based on Iron Python, and also with the help of the hops component to get access to all the so good stuff in Python 3. Um, and we are very much looking forward to the release of Grasshopper 2 and Rhino 8. So to be able to use Python 3 inside Grasshopper. Uh, a very important part of the structural design network is to develop skills uh, and to develop design communication skills. Uh, Rhino and the Grasshopper plays a very big part in this, and it enables us to visualize and communicate ideas. Uh, we use Rhino to communicate at different scales. Uh, this is a typical example of 
of how we communicate structure at large scale in sort of design competition phases. Yeah, here we see a proposal we did for the Prague concert tour. But we also communicate design at small scale with the use of Rhino. We, uh, to the left, you see a CLT column and a slab uh, and visualized with a with load transfer in the structure. Um, and this type of images is great to present in, in reports alongside more te technical documentation. Um, and to the right, we have a structural roof for a, for a long span exhibition hall, where the structure was an important visual feedback in the project. Uh, we use Rhino to communicate optioneering, where we investigate structural technology and uh, material. And this type of communication is, is very important in early stages, where we often investigate multiple type topologies. Um, I believe that the visual feedback that we can give the client in early design stages, so sort of without creating an advanced BIM model, uh, creates a good starting point for, for us to discuss uh, alternative materials and, um, and uh, design ideas. Grasshopper has opened up a lot of possibilities for us as designers and where we can evaluate multiple design parameters. Um, I believe this example sort of illustrates how Grasshopper enables us to, as structural engineers to consider design parameters that are not so sort of traditionally part of the structural engineering scope. Um, in this little script, uh, that we developed in a project together with uh, big architects, we wanted to estimate water drainage on a roof. Uh, we had a model of a roof uh, structure that was built with Rhino surfaces that we got sent for, from, from the architect. And with them, together with the architect, developed a script that basically traces a particle movement on that surface. And draws a drainage drainage path. Nothing, nothing too fancy, but very handy in this project. Um, and yeah, th this can be done using a few different grasshopper functions. But basically, it's a translation of a point in the z direction, uh, followed by a projection of of the point back to the surface. Uh, and this is done in a for loop. Uh, and when the move said movement and the projection is the same distance, uh, the for loop breaks and the drainage path is, is drawn on as a polymer. And it looks something like this. And um, this is simple development in, in projects yeah, we do all the time, dif different small scripts to sort of broaden our perspective. And it enables us to understand how in this project, how, how the curvature behaved both in terms of water drainage, as well as sort of structurally when we combine it with a structural analysis model. Okay, I will now hand over to my colleague Guillante that will talk to you uh, through a few of our recent projects where we made use for an grasshopper and uh, has helped us in the design process. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, so now, as mentioned, I'm gonna go through a series of uh, projects or case studies that we have been working on mostly the last uh, couple of years here at, at uh, Tirens. Uh, on the screen, you see a project that we have been working together with uh, Did Architects. Uh, it's a, a train station located uh, just outside Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, and here you can see the very particular kind of double curve uh, roofs and passes that Saha did very often uh, works with. Uh, you can understand that this type of geometries uh, using Rhino and Grasshopper is, is a key tool uh, for the success of the project. And uh, is uh, basically a must uh, to use uh, Rhino and Grasshopper in order to, to make this uh, design possible. Uh, so in this project, we we model, calculated, and coordinated the structure and the architecture um, with uh, Rhino, uh, and uh, 
not only we model it, but it was a very handy tool to coordinate daily during the progress of the project with the with the, the architects because in this case we both were using Rhino and then it was very handy to just send over uh, a part of the model or the complete model or even uh, a little part of the script. If we look a bit uh, more into one of these buildings that I showed before, this is uh, what we call the North Station. And uh, here, the, the complete roof was modeled uh, and uh, scripted in uh, Grasshopper. Um, and not only modeled, but also we created the finite element analysis that uh, using the plugin called Geometry Gym, we calculated in uh, sub 2000. And then we iterated back and forth with the architects to find a shape that will work both uh, for, for uh, structurally and architectonically. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we did use a uh, Rhino inside to send the final geometry to Revit and generate a few drawings. And uh, what was quite interesting in this project is that uh, we didn't have to deliver too many drawings. Uh, instead, we were delivering our report um, describing the, the structural system. And then uh, Rhino was also a very handy tool to make uh, nice visualizations and uh, renders and describe in a very educational and visual way how the structure actually works. Uh, this is another uh, quite similar example. This is another station building. Uh, it's uh, in Westeros. It's uh, a couple of hours from Stockholm, also in Sweden. And here we collaborated with uh, big architects from Denmark. and. Uh, you can see from the picture that it's also a quite complex project. It has many external parameters, such as the trains passing under uh, distances that we need to con we needed to consider from the tracks, uh, uh, the free heights, uh, and so on. And then on top of that, we had this uh, very complex uh, roof geometry that was had very limited uh, column uh, options, column location options. Um, yeah, so again, this project, uh, it's almost impossible to handle this kind of geometry in any other software than Rhino, Grasshopper, or at least to handle it in a in a certain amount of time. Uh, I'm going to go a bit further into the design process of uh, Vesteros uh, train station. Uh, we have been involved in this project since 2015, where we won a competition together with uh, big architects, as mentioned before. And uh, it's an ongoing project, but uh, here in this uh, slide, you can see how the shape of this roof has been changing over the years. Uh, there's been many, many iterations on the shape. And uh, here, what we did uh, over the design process is that we were able to do rapid testing using Rhino and Grasshopper to identify those geometries proposed by the architect that will actually work also structurally and iterate uh, back and forth uh, with them until we found the, the, a geometry that uh, seems to be working. Uh, here is again the, the current design. Uh, as mentioned, it's an ongoing project. And um, how was actually the workflow of uh, how we work back and forth uh, with the architects? Uh, well, first, we, of course, received an architecture model in Rhino. And from that one, we will pick a specific geometry that we will refer in our grasshopper model. In this case, was the top of the column, since the column location was already a rather fixed parameter because of the tracks. And the grasshopper um, or the Rhino grasshopper model was made uh, with a uh, few different plugins, but also we did some uh, scripting in Python. And with that, we created our structural model and geometry and also generated a finite element model. And uh, here there were many, many iterations and coordination within the design team. So we will test a finite element model and maybe realize that, okay, it will work better if we remove or add this column or if we make this uh, truss longer or shorter or uh, deeper in uh, height. So uh, then we iterated back and forth with the architects until we found a geometry that uh, will work for both sides. It was a very nice and smooth coordination. And we, of course, had a coordination model that uh, was in Rhino. 
So the 3D modeling and coordination within disciplines was, of course, uh, in a Rhino model. And uh, here you can see a script that Daniel has mentioned uh, before for the drainage of the roof. Um, and uh, in this case, it was very, very handy since uh, you can uh, realize that it's a complex geometry. So it wasn't that clear from just the 3D model to see where the water will flow and if it could potentially uh, maybe gather in some point in the middle of the roof and maybe create problems for the building inside. So with this script, we could uh, change the geometry of these triangles in the roof so the water will flow as much as possible towards the, the edges. Uh, when it comes to structural verifications, we had uh, most of the scripting done in Grasshopper. And uh, we could generate with the same script uh, three, uh, or we could link it to three different programs. In this case, Sub2000, Sophistic, and Caramba. And uh, why did we do that? Uh, well, it's a, it's a complex geometry, so it wasn't that clear how it would work structurally. And then it was quite nice to send it to different programs to verify that, that the, the roof worked in the same way and that we wouldn't miss anything. And then, of course, we generated some drawings. Uh, and um, the, the roof was modeled in Rhino, but actually the, the rest of the structure was mostly uh, drawn in Revit. And then we used uh, Rhino inside to send our roof geometry to Revit and uh, do some drawing generations in a smoother way. And uh, now I've gone through two examples that uh, you can think that they are a bit unusual or complex or fancy, but do we always work with complex and fancy geometries? Well, uh, not really. Uh, most of our time goes in quite normal uh, structure engineering uh, projects, uh, let's say. Uh, but uh, what we have realized lately is that uh, from these unusual projects, we learn a lot. We develop our computational design skills. And moreover, we discover the opportunities that these tools are giving us to apply to our other usual, more common uh, uh, projects. So now I will show a series of uh, scripts that we use and, uh, in a more, more normal projects. Uh, this one is what we call the red green light for a given uh, design criteria. So the design criteria in this case, or what you see in the screen is a staircase that is a cantilevering from a structure. And the design criteria is that the usage ratios for the structure should be less than one. The deflection should be less than L over 400. And the frequency of the first uh, uh, model mode uh, should be more than five hertz. Uh, and the, if that criteria is met, it will show green. If it's not met, it will show red. And then on the left part, we have a couple of parameters that we think are important, which is the total mass of the of the staircase that will, of course, affect the total cost or the final cost and the, um, the climate impact, a very important number to, to have around all the time. Uh, so what uh, we could use this script for is that we maybe sit together in a workshop with the whole design team or just with the architects. And we can change life some parameters of uh, like the width of the structure or the shape of it or the kind of uh, sections, steel sections that we're using. And then we can directly get a feedback if that works structurally. Of course, in an early design stage. Later, we will need to do more checks and go more in detail. But it's a good start point for our collaboration. Uh, moving on to another example, uh, what you see on the screen is how reaction forces are displayed in most of the commercial finite element software that you all use if you're a structure engineer. Uh, you can wonder, is this easy to understand? Well, uh, not really. Uh, all the numbers are shown in the same color and scale. It gets messy. Uh, some of them overlap each other. Uh, all the arrows are with the same scale, no colors to pinpoint any bigger or smaller forces. And uh, also uh, over that, it doesn't look that nice. So I wouldn't like to send this to, to a client. So what uh, we did here is that uh, we created a script that it's a very, very simple script, 
that basically displays reaction forces in different color scales and with different sizes of a bubble plot, depending if that force is bigger or smaller. Uh, we even have some arrows that the point uh, if they are, um, yeah, which way that reaction force is pointing. Uh, we can change the scale of the numbers. Uh, yeah, so essentially this makes a much more educational and um, you get a direct feedback. When you look at this, you understand where the big forces are or where the small ones are. And it's, uh, it looks nicer uh, to, to send to, to a client as well. And uh, one last example here. Um, this is about uh, horizontal, sta uh, horizontal stability calculations in early stages of the design. Uh, so usually we will do hand calculations for this, uh, but the problem is that uh, usually during the design process, the location of the stability walls or stability cores will change location over time, usually or over the design. So what we did here is that we created a script that uh, you can uh, link a DVG file in your Rhino and with a, of course, with a Grasshopper script running in the background. And you can draw your stability cores and walls in there. You see them in red and you apply external forces. Uh, that's the big arrow on the top that you can have from the Y direction or from the X direction. And basically this calculates the percentage of the external load that will be taken by each um, by each uh, wall or door. Uh, so here, place the video again. Uh, that will be load applied from the Y direction. We can also display it from the X direction. And uh, what we can do here is that we can, uh, in Rhino directly, we draw surfaces uh, that uh, display the wall. So we can just delete them and the force will redistribute. Or we can move them around or make them bigger and see how that affects. Of course, if they are bigger, they are stiffer, so they trigger more load. Uh, now it's displayed from the Y direction. If we make that stability core bigger, it's triggering much more load. Uh, we can move them around. Maybe we are sitting together with the architects and we try to find a location that is, uh, that is working better from them. And we can check life if that actually works structurally. Yeah, and here we can, we could, as I said before, we can move them around and you see how the, how the numbers change and get a direct feedback. So yeah, this one is uh, quite handy in the uh, early stages and for collaboration between structural engineers and architects. And then now I'm gonna hand over to Martin, who is gonna talk a bit more about uh, bridges. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Gente. I will continue with some examples on how I have used Grasshopper to connect Rhino to other softwares. This is a bridge called Dragstrom. It's located in Norrköping, and this was my first project after joining the bridge department at Turiens two years ago. I have never I had never used Grasshopper previously and never worked with bridges either, so everything was kind of new to me. It is actually three bridges, and the longest span is about thirty six meters. Our customers requested the shop and assembly drawings, and since it's a steel bridge, I figured Tecla was best suited for this particular project. I work with. I worked with an architect in-house at Turians who shaped the design of the bridge and he worked with Rhino Grasshopper so it all lined up pretty well to use parametric design and to use the Tecla Live Link on this, uh, this project. In hindsight, I can truly say this move really saved me because uh, we had so many changes during the project, so it had been almost impossible to manage it in time for delivery if I had made this manually. Uh, another aspect was the creation of shop drawings. When working manually, you always seem to produce discrepancies in the model, and that results in multiple drawings for parts that seem identical. But when I did this with Grasshopper, the accuracy was so good 
if I take the diagonal members for the truss, for example, of uh, four parts or something, I produced exactly one drawing. This was a, a really good workflow, and I could rely on Grasshopper to do the heavy lifting. Utopi, it's an art installation in a tunneling project in Stockholm. This project was kind of different because we already have had half the structure in place and had to design the bridge-like structure afterwards. Therefore, the design of the structure was made in a BIM model to adapt it to the existing structure, and I only got a set of nodes in an Excel sheet to work with. Uh, and with this build my Rhino model to connect with Sotistic uh, using their Grasshopper interface to perform the analyze and design. Since this project consists of almost all kinds of connection, I was really happy for the SAF export from Sotistic. With this I could do the design of the connections in Idea Statica and keep the parametric model alive during the entire project which was really good because the project took a lot of right turns along the way and changes did come uh, on a week to week basis. This is another project I am currently working on. It's called Fem Arresbrun, or if I do an exact translation, it's called the Five Penny Bridge. This is a rather iconic bridge in um, uh, it's called the Five Penny Bridge because before the bridge was there, you could pay a person to take you over the stream by boat. The bridge, before it was removed, was over 100 years old, and the citizens of Norrköping followed this project with great interest. Uh, the project has been going on for over seven years, which seems quite long if you consider the size of the bridge, but the area in which the bridge is placed are under nature conservation and has significant uh, historical values. This makes the construction of a new bridge according to today's regulation rather hard. So here Rhino Grasshopper really comes in handy. Using Grasshopper to set up specific conditions, you, it is, it's easy to try out different designs and check if it works with today's regulations. For example, the slopes of the bridge and the free space within the bridge. Also to check different design options, as you can see, the architect rendering on the right. Since this also is a steel bridge, we will use Tecla LiveLink uh, to manage the shop and the assembly drawings and also connect the model with um, FIA software such as Sophistic. In this way, you can assure your Rhino model is the single source of truth and the BIM model and the analytical model are the same. In an extension, since this is a steel bridge, you will need to perform analyze and design of the connections as well. Then you can use either Sophistic, SAF, Export, or ID Statica's own Grasshopper interface to do so. Either way, you can safely say that the analytical model reflects the BIM model, and that's always nice to know. Sometimes you are thrown into projects midway. This happened to me about a year ago, a big railway project that been, that's, had been going on for several years. My predecessor had built an amazing script controlling everything along several kilometers, which included retaining walls, noise barriers, and impact barriers, to name a few. But when, it got, when I got this script, it was, to say the least, a bit messy. I would like to shout out the telepathy plugin here. It's really saved my sanity working with this project and kept the project going on after I took over. A few good tips to enhance your Grasshopper usage. Use a template for your Grasshopper script. Uh, in this way, you always have your workflow ready for a new project. Either you create your own template or have some really nice person hand you over his. Uh, try to divide your scripting into different operation, operations like input-output operations. Uh, in this way, make sure other people can follow your workflow. Try to keep the spaghetti monsters at bay in any way you feel comfortable. I like the telepathy plugin, but there are other options as well. Python and c -sharp can be helpful when dealing with large amount of data in your script. Or else, make sure you have total control over your data trees if you don't like working with coding. And last, keep your script as clean as possible. So future you will thank you. Uh, I have sworn 
for myself more than once for making uh, a mess of my script. So I will I try to keep it as clean as possible. And this concludes my part of the presentation and then we will wrap things up. Thanks. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, I will end on this slide, I think, to, to summarize a bit what we've talked about today. Um, the, the role of the structural engineer as part of the early design process is important. Um, and it's important because that's where we have the most influence on the design process. Um, our structural design network is where we develop these skills to work with architects in a more integrated design process. And we can use parametric tools and computational design methods in our projects, but we know from experience now that we develop uh, these skills in the more unusual projects. And we can benefit from that in our more everyday usual projects to automate and to develop generic tools that everyone in the company can use. Uh, and in order to develop together and to sort of customize workflows in a large scale organization as TMs, we need to propose best practice routines. And we I just want to say that we are not software developers, uh, but we see code as our superpower to inform the design process. Uh, but I think we have a lot to learn from software development and how we handle and manage code as well. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation and we are uh, happy to, to take your questions. Yes, thank you. It has been great to see all the projects and uh, the way you work. Also how, how you combine Rhino and Grasshopper with uh, so many other softwares. It's quite impressive. And yeah, there's uh, some questions that I don't know if you have checked already. Yeah. If not, I, I can check them. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe you can read them to us and we can just... Yeah, uh, uh, as you prefer. Uh, the first one is from Ricardo Bastida. He says, in order to show results from the analytical model in Rhino, did you develop in-house plugin or did you use some specific plugin? Um, I would say it depends. We in early stage design we work quite a lot with Caramba, which is um, uh, a finite element program that actually sort of works inside Rhino and Grasshopper. Uh, so the results are are there in in the Grasshopper view. Um, then we trigger a third party uh, finite element uh, calculations from Grasshopper. Um, and that can be Sophistic or SAP or FEM design is quite uh, common in Sweden, at least, to work with. Um, but we don't really sort of show the results in the Rhino view. But we often work with both the third party finite element solver as well as Caramba um, to sort of both to, to verify results and to, to sort of show results in the Rhino report as well. I, I wonder if the question was maybe about like how how we show the results in the Rhino screen. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, I think so about uh, probably about the cost, about the carbon emissions. Or carbon yeah, emissions. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And in that case, is uh, I, I, now I have so many plugins installed, so I'm not sure from which one it came, but uh, is the is the command that is a text tag or a print text to screen or something like that is from a free plugin could be. Uh, I think I think we think it's think human or relevant or yeah it's probably human yeah uh, yeah so it's just like um, yeah that that's a good tip too. Mm, I mean yeah. we we use human and human UI quite exactly. a lot uh, human to just sort of extend uh, the Rhino of view port. Uh, a bit from Grasshopper and Human UI to develop sort of in-house user interfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. Okay, but you, do you have the the Grasshopper definition, or is it like a um, somehow a plugin that you use in the company? In in, the, in that case, the staircase example, it was um, yes, it was definition. calculations made in Caramba, and yeah. then the output from Caramba was just plotted into the Rhino screen so i just plotted the results i wanted to know like directly like the direct output, yeah. output that you want to make sure you always have in front of you to make sure it's correct 
then of course there were many results that I would only check in the in the Grasshopper code. Yeah, and we have we have tried to develop a few few sort of Python components that um, that do the same thing basically, uh, but we we sort of landed on that that the the human uh, plugin is quite quite nice. <laughs> yeah, I think out of users, uh, yeah, really using human for for everything. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is from NC, I'm not sure the name. And he asks, what percent percentage of projects at Tyrants use computational design, specifically with Grasshopper Rhino versus traditional engineering methods? Mm, good question. Um, I mean, we, we're a big company, so we have a lot of projects, uh, but I would say that it's growing. Uh, we, we are sort of core, uh, people that within our network basically that works quite a lot with computational design uh, but i think this sort of unusual as we said before these unusual projects sort of makes us develop in-house plugins and in-house tools that others can use and we also have a sort of a platform in the company that called the automation toolbox um, that's a platform where we can publish our scripts for others to use and and share ideas and scripts with each other. Okay, great. I think this one relates to, to another question from Federico Cucci that asks how many designers, engineers are proficient in grass operator? Uh, maybe I maybe I answer it already, but it's as I would say it's it's um sort of it's a growing number. Uh, we see that the engineers that come from from university today are much more proficient in in these tools than the ones that I've, I've been working in a few years uh, and we we try to have sort of uh, master degree projects that centers around computational design so we can hire them afterwards uh, but I would say it's a core of of not say 10 15 people that work quite a lot with computational design questions and then there's a few that are sort of users of, of the scripts. Um, yeah, okay. I think it's, yeah, it depends on the, on the project or. Yeah, yeah. and, and we say we, we, uh, we use it in all stages, but uh, we see the most, it's most beneficial in early stage design when we iterate a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. So the next one from Jolanta Grant asks us, uh, for climate impact, how do you uh, determine, determine a parameter to measure if your design is sustainable? Is it embodied carbon and mass? I can take this one. Um, if we are just looking at building structures, then of course the mass is the main parameter that we will look at, and then we will take the the factors that we multiply by to get the embodied carbon. So yeah, basically the 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 mass is the main parameter. Uh, and then of course uh, it depends if if we have a lot of information about the project about like uh, from where is the material gonna be transported or if we have EPDs, then we can get a bit further into that number or not. But uh, in the script that I shown about the staircase, for example that is the A1 to A3 factor. So it's basically the material quantity, but it doesn't take into account transport or uh, farther. Uh, so it, in this, in that case, it was a quite simple, but also a yeah, a simple way to get the output of how, how much climate impact uh, a structure is gonna have. But then of course it can be looked much more into detail. Yeah, and we I think we we also look at it as a sort of we we compare design mm -hmm. alternatives. So we we not always sort of maybe a, a sort of sustainability measurement is not very obvious. How much is two hundred kilograms CO two? Yeah. Uh, it's not as easy as under, to understand as how much reduction do we have between two alternatives. So we try to sort of look at it in that perspective in other stages. Yeah, yeah. I, I clearly understand that, that the, the number is not uh, as important as compared to the, the options that you, you are working with. Okay, um, the next one is, 
this one. Uh, yeah. Do you find that there are a specific structural uh, finite, uh, finite element analysis programs which are easier to interact with via Grasshopper, for example, Sophistic, Sub 2000, or other? Yeah, that, that's something we've been uh, working a lot with like, and trying to figure it out as well. Uh, of course, Caramba is the easiest one to interact with since it's built in. Um, and then, it, then I believe that it's a bit more into your own preference of which program are you proficient with, and then you find out that the plugins are they are used pretty much in the same way. Mm. So I use a lot of Sub 2000, and then I just got used to that plugin. Uh, Martin, you have more experience with uh, Sophistic. Yeah, I think their interface is really good, and it makes it like very usable. Uh, and if you if you take Sophistic for example, and you complement it with uh, their uh, CADIM code, you get a long way. Uh, so I. I prefer Sophistics, but I, I think it's what how you what your what your preference is. I don't know. I, I think you can manage all programs, but what your preference is. And I also also want to add that um, we have seen that we have a lot of engineers that are that work, for example, in film design, and they know film design quite well, and but have never touched Grasshopper, so. Having that connection with in Grasshopper sort of leads them into working with parametric tools. Yeah. Um, so I think if you want to sort of establish an organization around this in your company, or if you want to get more people sort of into Grasshopper, go from start where they are. What software are you using, and then try to transition into the parametric world, basically. That's very interesting. But you were also showing a, a project where you use a lot of different software, right? Like, the, I think it was the Zaha project. Uh, yeah, the Vesteros project with Big. And in that okay. case, we did use the same script to generate the, the finite element model in the Sub 2000, Sophistic, and Caramba. Yeah, okay. So you use all of them. No, no <laughs> <Yes>. preferences. <laughs> no, no, no project. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, to, to continue, the next one is if. Uh, you use evolutionary solvers like Galapagos or Wallace to optimize the structures? Uh, we do at some, uh, in, some in some projects, we, we do that. It's it's very powerful together with Caramba, I would say, to, to optimize structures um, in that way. Um, also, in terms of sort of form finding, we use Kangaroo quite a lot, uh, which is very powerful working with complex forms. Uh, to get sort of efficient shapes. Uh, so, yeah, we, we touch on that. It's not everyday work, but definitely, yeah. Okay. Uh, one second. Yeah, the next one is from Ricardo. That, yeah, pr sorry, Ricardo, that you can unmute. But he has a question from a figure you saw. I thought came from SAP, but it may come from Caramba. No, I, think that was the I think it was the previous yeah. questions that I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, about the analytical model if you develop the plugin. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't understanding it. Okay, so the next question from Kadim is, uh, do you all train engineers to use Grasshopper and scripting processes? Are computational design specialists also engineers or do they work alongside engineers? We we don't have uh, uh, computational designers that only work with computational design. Everyone is involved in in prog in the projects, uh, but have some different levels of, of specialization in in computational design. Um, and we train. We don't train all engineers in computational design, but we develop in-house educational material. Um, there's a lot of educations that you can go take uh, online and some are great uh, and some are not <laughs> uh, and we we try to sort of uh, develop education material that sort of works for how we work basically and then the, the goal is that the engineer learn enough to learn themselves uh, 
So you can maybe take a, a basic course in-house and then you can sort of develop your skills and then take an advanced course outside the company. Yeah, okay. Um, the next one from Jan Sitzra. Yes. How different will you use Python 3 compared to Iron Python? Uh, the, 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 the main difference is that Iron Python is limited in terms of external uh, sort of packages. Uh, if you want to do data management in, say, there's some, some packages in for machine learning, for example, and there's some packages for um, sort of data management or uh, matrix calculation that is very powerful in Python 3, uh, which is not uh, part of the Iron Python um, scope. Um, but what is powerful in, in Grasshopper with Iron Python is that you can use what's called node in code. You can get access to all the Grasshopper functionality inside the Python code. Uh, which we use quite a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And the next one from David Barbiero, it's quite long, uh, but he asks if, do you think that this computational approach applied to the structure, uh, structural calculation is useful only at the early stage design, uh, early design stage, or can it be useful also at the construction phase? For example, I was thinking to a grasshopper script to write the values of the forces that are transferred from a curtain wall to the brackets on the slab. Now it can, of course, be applied to, to any stage. Now we have to focus our presentation a lot into early stages, but uh, Martin, for example, showed some uh, picture from Idea Statica where connections were modeled basically in Grasshopper and those were final uh, construction uh, uh, calculations. Uh, so it can be applied to anything. And, as well for the example that uh, David was writing in there. So anything that is repetitive or complex in geometry, we see possibilities in any design stage. Okay, great. And there's one from Wilson. Um, do you use geometry gym to send elements to Revit or prefer directly in right inside? I do use the Geometry Gems plugin mostly for linking it to Sub2000. So I haven't tried the one to send it to Revit, or maybe I tried some time ago. But I think the Rhino Inside has worked pretty good when we have used it. So mm. I'm not sure if any of you guys have tried the Geometry Gems. Uh, no, not with Revit, no. Uh, Rhino Inside <laughs> is basically what we use. And we also use Speckle mm -hmm. um, to transfer to stream models, basically, between softwares. Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, okay, next question from Alan. Um, is regarding to the dilatation joints in steel members and compression regarding to the weather and climate conditions. So if the structural member is receiving a lot of energy from the sun, radiation, is there any way to bring this data to the Caramba members to consider it uh, simulated in real time? That's a very specific question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, I'm not sure in Caramba, but uh, SAP or Sophistic or some more commercial uh, external softwares, they do have a thermal uh, 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 you, can, you can add a thermal force into a steel member and then of course you can link those to Grasshopper, so I guess there's a way to to somehow stream that data from one to the other and maybe create a load and then you could possibly add it to Caramba as well. So I'm sure there is a way around it, but I'm not sure how Caramba specifically will will handle mm -hmm. this directly. And that, that that's also something we, we discuss quite a bit and when we do sort of parametric design and, and build scripts, it's how parametric do we want to be? Mm -hmm. How many parameters do we want to control? and, and what is actually going to change in our scripts and what's fixed. Um, and I think that's everyone has, that's working with Grasshopper and, and computational design has gone through that phase where they want to sort of everything and control every every part of a project or a structure or anything. And then you realize that 
is not really it's only you that benefits from from having all this control but no one is going to understand it no one's going to use it um, <laughs> and um, yeah so try to focus on the problem and then maybe do some manual work around it to make it work that's uh, my suggestion yeah in the best way thank you Okay, and the next question is about AI. German Suzuki asks, uh, given the hype around AI, and in particular AI-assisted engineering, how do you think AC can benefit from AI? Are you considering AI-based solutions in the future? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe we're not the right people to answer that, but uh, we are touching on it a bit. Uh, there's a lot of work going on on the architectural side, so generating renderings and, and stuff. But on the engineering side, we look, we, st we are start looking at machine learning uh, and how we sort of can generate data uh, to sort of inform us in early stages. So maybe do sort of a, generate a lot of data from our sort of late stages to use to make predictions in early stage design um and that that i see as a sort of the next thing for us to investigate um in terms of ai is so broad so um i guess it's going to take over eventually but uh as we see it now it's so sort of can empower us yeah okay okay and um, this one is from alan Wem. yes says, uh, for the bridge model, does it in final position or, or in cumbered position for fabrication? I don't know if you understand this question. I don't. Uh, uh, maybe it's like if I, is it uh, how we do the assemblies for the fabrication or is it like uh, how we take height on the deformation before so in the final position so uh, if it's assembly you you it depends on what fabric uh, what manufacturer you have uh, but uh, we we do it like uh, in yeah like the final position i think i i don't really understand the question so maybe we can uh, connect Afterwards, maybe we can talk about it. Look okay. up. Yeah, yeah, or maybe Alan is around. He can maybe explain a little bit more. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, also, this question from Grisha is quite complex. Is uh, how do you compute for the saleable and non-saleable areas for high density residential buildings? Hmm. But I'm not sure. If you have you I, it, maybe it's not really something we do. Uh, I would yeah. say uh, maybe it's something the the client asks, maybe the architects to to deliver. Uh, is it's not a question that we really handle as engineers. I would say. Okay, and just the last questions. Um, Rizalino asks, how Caramba connect to Rhino? Uh, you can explain. Yeah, so Caramba is um, a plugin to to Grasshopper, which you download either from Food for Rhino uh, or the package manager in, in Rhino. And uh, it's you. I think you need a license, so you pay you pay for it. Uh, but there's student licenses, and I think there's trial versions as well that you can use. Um, if you go to karamba3d.com, yeah, I think. I have shared the, the link in the yeah. chat. Yeah, and it, it's quite commonly used by structural engineers, uh, um, both in early design and also in later stages, I would say. Um, and I think that the powerful thing with Karamba is that you get this instant feedback in the Rhino viewport, which means that you can sort of elab elaborate on the geometry and you can connect to optimization algorithms and uh, get this feedback. The difference from 
connecting it to third party plugins like SAP or Sophistic is that you stay in the Rhino environment, uh, basically. Yeah. Okay, so I think that was the, the last one. There was a lot of comments saying thank you and great presentation and everything. I also want to, to thank you for, for this presentation. It has been great to see all the projects and how, yeah, how to use so many tools. And thank you for, for showing it to us. I don't know thank if you, you want to, to ask anything. Yeah, we are very happy to to be invited to this presentation. Thank you, Guillermo. Uh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Very nice for the questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Well, thank you all. I uh, uh, see that the last one. Yes, it has been recorded, so I will upload it to YouTube probably tomorrow, so you can always check it again. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank nice you. Afternoon. Bye. -bye. Bye. See you.